when you become a member of Assembly for the Arts, you're becoming part of a movement. As you know, arts and culture in our city, it's, we're, we're really in a renaissance time right now. Um, we have a lot of artists who are creating legacies of their own. We're the promo team, we are the contract writers, we are the grant writers, we are the everything. Work smarter and not harder. And to me, that is hustling. Like, it's just hustling on a higher level. The mindset of how you approach this, how you go into it, is how you finish. How many people in the room consider themselves entrepreneurs? And that's everybody. Sometimes speaking up is a good thing. I can it's essentially, they want a grant, it's aligned with our mission. As far as building my network as an artist and getting more exposure as well. Um, take a pretty large cut of uh, wages that we believe should be going to artists. The creative field is making money and looking at some alternative methods for generating income. That conversation was about creative spaces. And so this one is going to be about how the creative field is making money and looking at some alternative methods for generating income. Um, let me just say, I am Meg Hatko. I am the Director of Community Relationships at Assembly for the Arts. And I am joined here by a lot of folks from our team. Um, Valerie Schumacher, who's our Director of Strategic Initiatives. Veronica Thornton, who is downstairs. You probably saw her V. Keith Gray, who is our summer intern from Studio Institute, and our Chief Community Officer, Deidre McPherson, who is here, and I'm just gonna hand over for a sec. Not Janita. Oh, it's Janita, where's Janita? There you are, there you are. <laughs> Janita Blue, who is here, our marketing this communications director. Hey, good evening everybody, how's everybody doing? Hey, oh, nice, I was expecting all that. Good energy being here, good energy. We're here to talk about Creative income. As Meg said, my name is Deidre McPherson. Uh, I'm, I'm Assembly's Chief Community Officer. And um, as you may know, for, well, first I should say, for how many of you is this your first time attending an Assembly for the Arts event? Our region's Arts Council. So uh, we support artists and the art industry here in Cleveland and do all we can to help progress conversations in advocacy, in racial equity in the arts, in uh, policy uh, to make the arts cultural seem healthier and more vibrant, and um, we, we do a lot of activities and programs surrounding that. Uh, as Meg mentioned, our program tonight, it's, it's here to talk about creative income, and we want to empower artists to network and connect with one another, uh, and we want to empower artists to monetize their ideas. Uh, all of you are, are creatives and entrepreneurs, and, and your individual artists are businesses, and we want to support that as best we can with uh, professional development, uh, opportunities to come together and talk and share resources. And um, so if you're not already, um, I encourage you and I invite you to consider becoming an Assembly for the Arts membership. Don't worry, it's not a cult. Uh, <laughs> sometimes the word membership sounds scary, but basically when you become a member of Assembly for the Arts, you're becoming part of a movement. As you know, arts and culture in our city, it's, we're, we're really in a renaissance time right now. Um, we have a lot of artists who are creating legacies of their own, institutions of their own, uh, going into existing institutions and disrupting existing ways of doing things to do things differently or better or in a more progressive way. Uh, at Assembly for the Arts, we're, we're trying to help progress for change to make our arts industry better. Uh, and so we want to hear from you. So becoming part of the movement, joining Assembly for the Arts, that's part of that work. Uh, have your voice heard, show up, and, and uh, we greatly appreciate you all for showing up today. Um, if there's anything we can do to assist you in your endeavors, um, Meg mentioned all of our staff. Staff, raise, raise your hands. Uh, you're gonna see us a lot out in the community. Um, our job, what we also do is we go to a lot of events that are happening. If you have an art opening, if you have something that you want us to be at, that you really care about, that you want us to speak up for, please reach out to us. I'll be sticking around after the event, so uh, I'm happy to chat then as are all of us. So welcome and enjoy the program. Okay, so I am, as long as everybody can hear me pretty good and see me sort of, I'm going to stay seated. And I would encourage everyone who's talking during this time to either stand up if you feel compelled to or sit down um, and join the conversation that way. We're keeping it, you know, whatever you feel most comfortable with. So 
I just wanted to provide a little bit of opening context here um, about why we're bringing folks together around this topic. We have learned that creatives are really making income from so many different sources, and oftentimes these are really patchwork together through you know multiple streams. Um, we see a lot of folks um, obviously applying for grants, uh, direct sales. Um, you know, some of the more traditional ways, but we wanted to take this time to look at some of the things that aren't maybe as common. So yeah, we wanted to take a look at some of the methods for accessing capital and generating income that we don't maybe typically think of when we think about being a creative or being an artist or being a creative business owner or even being part of a nonprofit. So we assembled some folks from the community. We have uh, some artists here, we have some experts here, and we're gonna hear from them as key voices. A couple things I wanna just mention about the structure of this conversation. So we're very intentionally seated in a circle. Um, you know, all oftentimes you go to panel discussions and you've got a panel, and then you've got an audience. And we're intentionally doing away with that so we can get rid of that line between panelists and audience. Everybody at the end of the day is part of the community, and we want to operate as one community in arts and culture. So that's, you know, that's key to just sort of keep in mind. We want everybody to contribute, everybody to participate, whether that's actively listening or speaking up during the conversation. Is Carrie Miller from HFLA. We have Andy Schumann, who is right here. And Andy is um, organizer of the Cleveland Art Workers Collective. Did I get that right? Yes. And an independent musician. I have next to me Lacey Talley. And Lacey is an independent visual artist. I think, you know, I, I classify you as multidisciplinary because I feel like you do a lot of things. And over here in the red hat is Dale Good. And Dale is an independent visual artist as well. So I'm going to ask each of our folks from our artist panel. So that's Lacey, Andy, and Dale <clears throat> to talk with us just for a minute, and I want to ask you guys to give us kind of a brief snapshot of who you are as an artist and what you do in the community, and then I want to ask you to speak about one, one uh, success and one challenge that you faced in generating money through your creative practice. So earning a living, generating money, seeking money, accessing capital. So. Who would like to start it? Well, I'm right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Can y'all hear me? Yeah. So my name is Lacey Talley. I am a multidisciplinary artist. <laughs> and I'm um, based here in Cleveland, Ohio. And I'm also like a graphic designer, illustrator, educator, muralist. Um, I would say one of the major successes I recently had was having a partnership with Makers Mark. So they reached out to me last summer for their Art and Soul program. And it's a program that highlights emerging black artists making a difference in their community. And it was about six of us all in the Midwest region. And with that partnership, they license one piece of my artwork for a year. Um, I would have to, I live painted at four events throughout the year in Cleveland, Columbus, and Cincinnati. A major corporation helped a lot as far as building my network as an artist and getting more exposure as well. Um, Oh yes, also through those shows, like I was able to introduce another side of me, so I also live paint and sing at the same time. Mm. And that has brought like a lot of different opportunities as well. So like that's something I'm super thankful for. So I would say like that's been like a huge su success in my art career. Um, I would say a challenge is having consistent income because as an artist like like even though I was doing those shows and I was under a contract the other day I wasn't doing the shows I still have to like you know eat make money and pay my bills so it's like finding different ways to sustain myself through educating um, website design presentation design 
logo, just any other things that I'm like um, an artist in to sustain myself. Uh, my name is Andy Schumann. Um, I am an anti-capitalist organizer with the Northeast Ohio Workers Center. Can you talk about this a little bit more? Yes, I can. Um, I'm an organizer with the Northeast Ohio Workers Center. I help low-wage uh, workers get back stolen wages from their employers. Um, my background is largely in event planning and performing as a singer, as a songwriter, in a very loud rock band where I just kind of yell the whole time. Um, and uh, th I think one of the main things that I'm excited to talk about today is my work with the Cleveland Art Workers Collective. So we are a, we're an anti-profit group of creative people who host events, mostly at Black Punk Press is our primary collaborator. Um, and we put on, you know, around like maybe 30% of the total events that they've had at that space. And what we do is um, we redistribute 100% of the proceeds we receive at the show to the performing artists, rather than keeping any for any sort of promoter or for the space. And the reason that we do that is because most of the for-profit venues in town um, take a pretty large cut of uh, wages that we believe should be going to artists. Um, yeah, so it's, it's hard because of course that means we're not paying ourselves, right? So that's a big challenge. I would say that's my challenge. The challenge is to resist some of these fundamental pay inequity structures. Somebody, that means that we're doing a lot of hard work that we, we cannot receive compensation for uh, in the name of a good cause, but it's really difficult. I think on, on the up end is uh, when we first formed this collective, we had started talking about it in 2022, I think. And um, I was concerned, having grown up in the city of Cleveland, uh, and as I got older and older and more in more and more privileged spaces, I noticed how, you know, of course me um, feeling comfortable in these spaces, but like how much less diverse they got as I got into more privileged spaces spaces where artists were paid more money and things like that. And I was concerned about racial segregation in Cleveland, but all my you know, childhood friends of many different backgrounds all got together and, and uh, as we were having these conversations, the, the realization was that the reason a large part of this racial segregation happening in Cleveland is just pay inequities. It's a lot of times People just need to get paid to make art. And, and because of how you know, redlined the city is, a lot of times people, east siders that grew up with not a lot of money are not the people playing shows on the west side because they're not getting, like the, these venues don't pay people and uh, it's really necessary for, if you're gonna take a, a day off your shift, you need to make sure you get paid. Um, so that's how the Art Workers Collective kind of evolved out of conversations about why this segregation is happening and, and what could bring people together more, uh, payment. So that's, a, that's the good thing, that we formed the collective. The hard thing is that we don't pay ourselves. We have to just pay the performers of the night. Yeah. You just have to be, focus on the people that are doing what they tell you to do, get things on in on time, um, reference your referrals, your photographs, or whatever, and they're going from there. I'd like to thank Jeremy, I'd like to thank the staff here at Assembly for the Arts. But the thing that I found really amazing in this city, I kid you not, I see my galleries came in, I believe that's Liz Marvin's back here, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Everyone that has helped me assist in my career is a female. Liz Marlin from Worthington Gallery down on West 6th Street. My gallery is Hillary Clint at Gent at Head Gallery. Mindy at Artist Archives. They've been very, very good at giving me guidance, giving me direction, coming to my various outdoor studios. The heat 80, 90 degrees, we want to show this work, we want to do this, and just going forward. 
I'm a truth with you that I've been a Then a lot of doors slammed in my face, but I mean, you just have to go forward. There's a lot, an awful lot of competition out here. I don't care what color the race is or what have you. I have several other proposals that I have to different foundations that I submitted. And also, over the last two years, I've had five museums show. And please don't take that lightly. Because the first three or four things a gallery owner or a dealer will ask you, especially the new and young guys, when you come in is, do you have a portfolio? Can I do a studio visit? Can you show me or bring me 40 or 50 pieces that I can choose from to give you a show? And where is your studio located? It's just that simple. One of the cardinal rules is that you never, ever, ever just walk into a gallery Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, whatever day it is. They may not represent the kind of work that you have. And it's all about being professional. The last couple of years I spent a lot, a lot of time just going to shows and exhibitions, museums and galleries, and seeing how the work is staged, how it's presented, how it's found, how it's lit. I mean, that is really, really crucial. Uh, Hillary did a show for me in January. I was really kind of stunned. Maybe I shouldn't be sharing this with you. She showed 11 of my pieces. She said, Dear, we're going to up the prices on these. I think at the point now where you can demand this kind of price. After the show was over, we all kissed and hugged. I went to start my car and put my head on the steering wheel, and my eyes got real moist. I mean, it's really a seminal moment. Uh, God forgive me, but just this shameless self-promotion that I have, if you don't do it, it's not going to get done. I have an exhibition now. I tried to pass out as many flyers as I could. I see I run out uh, at Winton Place, 127th and Lake Road, right next door to Stoker Street Judgment. It's a whole new body of work. The next time Hillary and I sit down and talk, she wants to see new work. She doesn't want to see the same old work over and over and over again. And this may sound kind of cruel and harsh. I've gotten this from a lot of professional people that come in galleries, people who look at my work. Man, you want 3000 for that? You want 4000 You got to be kidding. I say, well, you know, I just gently excuse myself to step away from that. I mean, I'm, I'm being very, very sincere. I talked to some younger artists who came in this evening. You just have to keep going forward. Uh, finally, uh, with Liz, with Hillary, with Mindy Tosby, even with Grace at the Sculpture Center, uh, you shouldn't be ashamed to have anyone come to your gallery if you're doing the work. You're doing the work. You know that doing the work is right. I'm now beginning people to give me a call, uh, emailing me, yeah, we'd like to see this, we'd like to see that. I have an outdoor studio at 65th and Huff. The young lady is rotating the artist there, but I still have about six or seven of my large outdoor sculptures. I'm doing a body of work on domestic violence called Domestic Violence Isn't Pretty. And lo and behold, I submitted my proposal to Assembly of the Arts, and out of the 100 applications, I was one of the 16 that was rewarded with the grant. So that speaks volumes to me uh, about that. It's something that's real personal to me and my own family, uncles, aunts, and dad. It wasn't pretty when I saw that, so I said, this is what I'm gonna do. A body of work for the next nine months a year on domestic violence. If you go straight across 30th to Payne Avenue, attorney Grace, Grace, is the CEO and the director of the Domestic Violence Center there. She has one of my big sculptures that I've done in the lobby of her building. Uh, she's also a big collector of mine. And you know, the word spreads. I feel so embarrassed. I ran out the house and left my stack of cards. Usually after I say hello to you, I put a card in your hand. Uh, a lot of people have called me after going through there clothes at home or whatever, or oh, I finally found your car, then they give me a call. 
even if a person comes to the gallery and doesn't buy anything on the museum, it's a form of patronage. They're supporting it. And believe this, if you don't mean nothing else, a lot of artists go to shows and exhibitions to see what the competition is doing. I mean, they really, really do it. And I'm not trying to say this to down or not or demean any. Look at these little young whooper snappers, these generation X, Y, Z guys. I'm an artist. I'm a photographer. So really? And it's like this in the front. Or they come up to you like, uh, well, anybody can do that. I say, well, you do it. You do it. Well, you're not worth that. You know, so I just kind of ignore them and go on about my business. But as an encouragement to those of you who are in the creative field, uh, believe me, what they gave me, $6,300 or $6,000, you're going to account for every penny of that money. Just like I received a grant from Spaces last year, when I was through, they wanted a CD, they wanted a jump drive, and they wanted an artist statement, and they weren't about no foolishness because they will send Uncle Sugar to your house to ring your doorbell. <laughs> and by that I mean they want to know what you did with their money, and that's the only right. So ain't no going to no Bahamas, ain't no going to Trinidad, ain't no going to South America. And I told a brother that about a month or so ago, and lo and behold, they rang his doorbell, so now he's getting the earache from them. Where's our money, and what did you do with it? Phil, thank you so much. But, okay. Appreciate, yeah, I want to, I want to, Okay, I'm sorry, but no, you're, you're good. We appreciate this, and I think this is your what you're seeing is a really great um, segue into the next part of this, which is um, I want to open this up to our discussion. So I have a couple of questions. Dale really represents um, an artist who who is kind of pursuing that traditional path as what we know uh, in terms of a visual artist specifically. So applying for grants, having gallery representation, having a very clear studio practice, um, exhibiting work. And I want to open it up and ask how are folks generating income through your creative practice that does not involve applying for grants or uh, you know working through that with more traditional trajectory? I sustain myself is through art consultation. Um, and so basically what that will look like is I'm sure a lot of us are approached um, you know, by clients with ideas. And not only ideas, but like, you know, they have a they might have some sort of idea of what they might want to create. But a lot of us, how can I say, a lot of us kind of give them the sauce without really asking for much of a commitment. So guess what, if you give them your IP, then they could really just go to the person that'll do it cheaper. And now can you be mad at them if you do that? And so uh, art consultation, and I guess what I've been able to leverage with my own personal experience and what I do is I'll try to set up a consultation with the person, charge, you know, 250 an hour to essentially to help them go through their ideas. And if, this is something that they want me to take care of, then I can take them through the next step. But at least if they decide that I'm not the person that they might be the right fit, or I might be out of their budget, then they can now at least take the IP that we've talked through, I was compensated for my time, and then they can sail into the sunset and go about it however which way that they decide. So that's one way that I have, um, you know, do a uh, art consultation. I took foot for you. Oh, well, I was just wondering, like, what specifically are you consulting with, are they consulting with you on? Um, so really just creative problem solving. And so, like, that's very vague, and, and it should be, because, um, you know, how can I tell you solutions if, you know, without a dialogue, you know? So, me, just how you would go to therapy and you know your therapist aren't your therapist isn't gonna come out and just be like, oh you have BPD. There's da -da -da -da. Like, no, there is there's interviews that occur, there's conversation and dialogue that occurs, and you know, when you're able to leverage your experience and what you've done and it's proven and you can, you know, if you're standing on empirical data, 
just being able to talk with the client through what they actually want, being able to give them a direction is very valuable because a lot of people don't know what they actually want to do. They might think, oh, I want a painting or this, but it's like, no, dog, you need a logo. Hmm. Or it's like, oh, I, I, I think I want marketing material. And it's like, no, you just need like a little pamphlet, you know? And so really being able to just guide people in the right direction and kind of taking it like a step at a time versus me just coming out and be like, hey, I want 5,000 for this logo, or hey, I want 5,000 for this strategy. It can be easier, it's an easier engagement to just be like, hey, spend this 250, we'll chop it up. And you know, you can go on your way, and I'm always here for you if you, you, you know, if you look, need a further assistance. Thank you guys. Uh, my name is Andy, the third. I'm a filmmaker and also uh, own a uh, company that does video storytelling and uh, graphic development for, uh, anyway. So long story short, um, I think uh, I've kind of seen, like, when I was growing up, I've been a uh, been practicing filmmaker and uh, video producer for the past 15 years, I'd say. And, uh, you know, normally what I kind of see is one is the, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, it was either like teaching was a big thing, like going and like either working in the schools or working, you know, kind of with people to like teach the craft to something. I mean, something along those lines. Um, and in my field, a lot of times, it's working with organizations to kind of tell their full cool story so that um, they can be proximate to the people that they're trying to reach through that storytelling. Um, the issue kind of becomes where, you know, you're shooting things and things of that nature, you're creating videos and things, but it's proximate to your practice, but it's not completely your practice. So a lot of times, one of my mentors told me a while ago, like, you have to have work that feeds your heart, but you have, you have to have work that feeds your belly, but you also have to have work that feeds your heart. And, you know, if you're a practicing, if you're a practicing artist, you know, sometimes the, the goal is, okay, I, I'm getting contracts and, you know, I'm doing things and I'm shooting, I'm using a camera every day. But if you're not also practicing your practice and like giving yourself working to, you know, move your move your art in a different direction, that can become a uh, kind of a mind trip because it feels like you're doing it, but you're not necessarily doing it. So it's important to continue to practice along with that. And then that becomes kind of a thing because like, you know, one kind of gets the other. If you have to do the one work in order to do the other thing, and that's where some of the supplemental kind of work, and that's what I'm kind of working through right now, is like figuring out like how to kind of balance both of them so that I can continue to kind of push, you know, my goals for my life in tangent with the goals that I have for other organizations, things of that nature. Yeah. So just repeating the question so everybody knows. So, in, in what ways are you generating income that is does not involve applying for grants or that traditional trajectory for artists? Davon. Hi. Hi everyone. I'm Davon Brantley. Sorry I'm sitting. I have my baby. Uh, <laughs> um, but as what I do in order to um, create extra income besides applying for grants and exhibiting um, and also consulting as well too, I'm glad that was brought up, um, is I offer portfolio development courses for young artists that are looking to, you know, either apply to an art school or not even go to an art school. So I even do that also as a full-time job at the Cleveland Institute of Art, but I also do it outside of that um, sphere as well too, um, especially for students where it's not feasible to actually go to an art institution due to finances, things like that, not having the proper courses. Um, so I've been doing that for a couple years where I'll work with um, some parents, they know their kid is interested in the arts, and I'll give them the techniques, the advice in order to develop their portfolio at a really decent rate. Um, and so yeah, I think that's like a great way to earn some extra money as well too, um, because it could go into a lot of diverse fields. So if you're a muralist, and you know that some of our youth want to get into that type of spectrum. Um, offer them advice, not for free, but <laughs> giving like certain uh, price structures for them depending on the situation could help um, make extra income as well too.
Uh, yeah. I think one way to generate some income, particularly in, in music, is to withhold uh, your labor until you have a contract that you feel really, really good about. Unfortunately, um, if you're a performer in a, like an independent band or an independent song, singer-songwriter, it's really easy to play shows. I'll stand up. It's really easy to play shows and not be told how much you're gonna get paid and you're kind of waiting around at the end and looking for someone and the owner's being kind of dodgy. This happens at places all around the town. I won't name names, but it happens very frequently. And I think what happens is because we love doing art so much, we just want to play the show. We just want to play the dang show. And I think something like what Aaron was saying, actually, what's up, Aaron? I, th I think it was really cool you saying, like, I set that rate in advance because if something happens, I get that rate, though, yeah. even if they're not going to go forward with me. So I think what's really, really important, uh, as a performer particularly, is to, to make sure that that information is crystal clear between you and the unquote. Uh, because frankly, um, musicians are not particularly protected as workers. So you need to be, and I think artists at large aren't. So it's really, really important to have stuff in writing uh, prior to engaging. Um, even just a text. Texts are good, contracts are good, um, but any way that you can officially say exactly how much you need, and that can also help people outside of yourself, because if you're able to convince your friends and collaborators in your creative field to not take on projects below a certain price point, then it'll be a lot easier for that price point to come up a little bit. Um, there won't be people doing projects consulting for free, because it'll be hard if Aaron's offering $250 an hour consulting, and like I'm offering $10 an hour consulting, but people know that, so we gotta be sure not to undermine. Fellow, fellow artists. I will say, in, in light to what Andy just said, like, okay, so I'm really just curious, like, who thinks that it's possible to be a professional artist and to not engage in a hustling mentality? Just a show of hands. Like, who thinks it's possible? No, okay, okay, let me rephrase this. Who thinks that you can make it as an artist and not be a hustler? Show of hands. <laughs> no, hi, hi, I, because I need to like visually see this. What do you define as a hustler? Uh, you do it here. You said, what do I define as a hustler? Yeah. I, I mean, like, okay. Who needs me to like explain what a hustler is in this context? I, just out of curiosity, like, there's this idea of like hustling culture and being an artist, and how we may separate the idea of being an artist from actually being like business people. <coughs> and so I'm just curious, like who thinks that those things live like separately from each other? I think they can live separately. You said they can? I think, I think we can break the hustle mentality. I think that it's a, it's, it's not easy, I don't think that it's an easy thing to do. I think that it takes a lot of strategy. I think it takes a huge network. I think it takes having a collective group of people that you work with that are all on the same page that help you to get to the desired outcome. I don't think that hustling is bad because a lot of artists have to start hustling before we get to the point where we can break out of the rat race and get to a point where we are corporate level and it's not hustling anymore. A different level of work. I think sometimes when you come in, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm Donnie Lene. <laughs> I'm a singer and songwriter, so um, yeah, bear with me. My voice is only going to go so far. Um, but I think that the hustle is important, right? And a lot of us artists, we start out with the hustle. We are the, the, the artists, we're the promo team, we are the contract writers, we are the grant writers, we are the everything in a nutshell. But I think it gets to a point where we have to be smart about how we manage our money, smart about how we manage our time, how we manage our uh, human capital, our resources, our people around us, um, and, and getting creative with how we do things so that we're not in the rat race, I think. 
and I, I've seen people get out of it, and I don't think that it, it, it becomes obsolete. I just think that as artists, we have to really get smart about how we do things so that we're not always doing all of the things. I think that's the hustle that I when I when you talk about hustle, it's like me being 20 people doing 20 jobs as one person when I really just want to get on stage and sing. Yeah. You know? Um, but it, it takes a whole lot of know-how or knowing people who know how so that I don't have to do it. And then a lot of trust and building relationships and being able to work smarter and not harder. And I think that that is how you get out of the rat race or get out of the hustle mentality. But it's, it's somebody gonna hustle. I just don't want it to be me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got someone over here who wants to say something. What's up, Chris? Hey, everybody. I'm uh, Krista Freelance, or Krista Freelance, whichever. Hey, it's like, it's like, but like, to your point, I feel like you just explained a group of hustlers. Like, yeah. real talk. You didn't, like, it's not that you, you don't stop hustling. You literally can't get to that level unless you hustle. Like, I got the, the team and the support of people around me because they see me hustling. Yeah. I trusted them to support me because I seen them hustling. It's literally a hustle. And if you're not really hungry and you're not around people that's hungry, I don't feel like you can really I don't, it's not that, I don't see, when I hear hustle, I don't think, oh man, I'm on, I'm a hamster on the wheel all day. Like when I hear hustle, I think, oh, I'm about to go to this city, I'm about to go to that city, I'm about to go to this art show, I'm about to go to that art show, I'm about to do this piece, I'm about to work on this piece, I'm about to apply for this, like, it's not, and then even though you're doing all of that, then you, other people see you doing it and they're like, hey, I could apply for stuff better than you. You know, but I need an artist to, like, you know, to support the grant that I'm trying to get. So let's team up. All right, so now it's two people that already have the same idea, the same focus, the same energy, and they're just creating, like, a team. And I feel like big corporations, like, you, they meet up. They have, it's CEOs. Everybody gets together. It's people on, people on marketing. Everybody gets together and talks about, what they need to do, like that that is to me that is hustling. Like it's just hustling on a higher level. I don't feel like hustling ever will really stop, if that makes sense. Yeah, this this is not for the dreamers. But case in point, you know what I mean? Like and what Crystal was saying, like the mindset of how you approach this, how you go into it, is how you finish. Like how you handle the small things. It's how you will inevitably handle like a larger thing. So, me kind of just, and I can just wrap this up real quick. Going back to what Andy was saying, is it's the mindset of adopting the business element which is going to change the difference. I've been in this space, I guess, professionally for only three years, and I have only one body of work. Just one. The only thing that really moved the, the metric from how I came into the space and now, it's not like I've been in the lab like creating new work, but it's in fact how I'm using my time, my resources, the grants and the money that I do have access to, how am I using that and reinvesting that in myself? See, we can sit here and complain about bread and the lack thereof all day, but if you don't know how to spend five hundred dollars, you think you're gonna be able to spend five bands, ten thousand, thirty thousand? So, case in point, or just I guess what I'm trying to say is, it's more so about, in my opinion and experience, it's more about our our mindset, our mindset. How do we look at the our product? How is the piece? The, whether it's music, whether it's uh, visual arts, whether it's singing, our deliverable, the product itself, that's, that's the product. And now if you're able to switch on that entrepreneurial mindset and be like, okay, I have a product. How am I going to market this? How am I going to package this? What other resources do I have now in terms of getting this distributed and out there? Like if you're not looking at it that way, then it's going to be challenging because guess what? 
y'all think these institutions is looking at it anything less? Thank you. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> yeah, I, I, to, um, I really appreciate how, how Lacey kind of talked about diversifying your income stream. So like, uh, to, to Aaron's point, you need to have multiple hustles. You know, how are you monetizing different skill sets to contribute to your overall uh, thrivability so that uh, you can kind of reduce the wait time, if you will, between big projects that are bringing in money uh, to support your practice, to support your day-to-day -day, uh, expenses as, as an artist. Um, Meg, did you want to ask another uh, question in this particular part? Or Well, I think we want to be able to hear from Carrie. Um, we go, you know, so we have some time, but yes, thank you so much. This has been just an excellent discussion. I know there's other comments. Um, I think everything that was said, too, is really interestingly universal across creative disciplines so far that I've heard. I didn't hear any one thing that was really like, you can only be a visual artist and do this. All of these things were, seemed to be universal to me, so I thought that was really cool. Um, but yeah, I'm going to chance it, give it to Deidre. Deidre's going to introduce Carrie, and we will hear from her. All right, start so, a discussion. Thanks, Meg. So uh, we have a special guest here uh, the, to add to the conversation around thinking about loan systems. So we have uh, Carrie Miller here. Uh, hi, Carrie. Uh, Carrie's from the Hebrew Free Loan Association. So uh, if, Harry, if Carrie, if you could just tell us a little bit about HFLA, the Hebrew Free Loan Association, and how uh, some of your services and programs can support artists in our region. So uh, I will give a very brief history of our organization and talk a little bit about what we do, but I'd like to spend the majority of the time talking about how we, how we can, our loans can be used in the community. So. Uh, my name is Carrie Miller. I am the executive director of the Hebrew Free Loan Association. We go by HFLA because we are non-sectarian and have been pretty much since our founding, which was almost 120 years ago. We have three main types of lending that we do. We have a standard loan, which is a lot of financial emergencies that should arise. And as I'm, I'm listening in the room, I think that um, I'm going to come back to that one in more detail in a minute, but uh, home repair, auto repair, uh, we, we do debt consolidation, all interest-free lending. We have education loans. The intention with these are to be um, for a uh, four-year college or university. They're meant to be small, lasted dollars to help you get to you know, just over that, that hump to help you achieve your education goals. And then we do small business loans. We recently just increased our loans from $10,000 to $20,000. Our Most of our lending is in the $10,000 range, but our business loans, seeing the need, uh, we increased that to $20,000. So there were a whole bunch of questions I was gonna ask the group, but a lot of them just got asked and answered. So, uh, check, that one's done. Uh, but one of the things that I, I think came out in that conversation to me and, um, that was one of my questions is, you know, you use the term hustle. In our, in our work, I, you know, how many people in the room consider themselves entrepreneurs? And that's everybody. And I, and I think, you know, one of the things that is, is so rich in our community is an entrepreneurial system of, that provides resources, to everybody, regardless of, of where you're coming from. And so, you know, at HFLA, we do not provide technical assistance support. One of the things I can tell you from um, some of the conversations I've been in with our organization and other uh, lenders, non-traditional lenders, we're a nonprofit lender, we are not a bank. Um, I will, again, go into a little bit more of how our lending works. But, you know, one of the things that I don't care, excuse my soundtrack going on in the background, I bring that with me everywhere I go. Uh, but uh, one of the things that I don't care a lot about is how we can support creative entrepreneurs. And I think that that conversation in those rooms happens in a very separate bucket, but it's the, it's the same thing. And so one of the, the things that I was really thinking about as we were talking, is I was listening to this conversation, is, you know, how can you articulate what your business is? So I guess one of the other questions I had, how many people in the room are registered with the Secretary of State's office as a business in some form or fashion? So a good number of people. So um, you know, being able to articulate 
what your business is and how your business works to people like me is the challenge, um, but is also, I think, worth spending some time that really thinking about, because I don't know, we just had a gentleman come in, um, and I got a little um, all over the place as a result of that conversation, but hopefully it's, it's helpful, and I'm here to answer questions. We just had a gentleman come in who uh, produced a record, and he was getting it pressed on vinyl, and super excited about being able, like, being, having his record on vinyl meant something, I can guarantee you that nobody in our office knew what it meant. <laughs> like, awesome, they're gonna be purple. That sounds great. Um, but we have no idea what the industry is, we have no idea what it means to price something like that, we have no idea what distribution looks like, we have no idea what to expect as income, and we really um, need artists and creatives to spend that time talking to us, but also thinking in advance of, of what that looks like and how to present that to us. So um, that was the one thing I was really thinking about as I was listening to that. One of the things with our lending, so um, I talked about the types of lending we do. One of the things that we do, so you go to our website, there's an application, you fill it out, we receive that application, we review it. We will pull a credit report, um, but we do not look at a credit number. We do not look at a score. We are looking at your credit report to understand your history and your history with your finances. If you had a bankruptcy in the last five years, that's fine. If we see positive movement from that, that's not something that will hinder us from, from giving you a loan. Um, we, we just want to make sure that, that you understand what it is to have a loan and to repay it. Uh, we will look at a budget. We ask for a, a monthly budget and two months worth of, one month worth of bank statements now. Um, and, and we'll look at that just to see that you're going to have money left at the end of the month to be okay. We don't, you know, as we all know, situations, emergencies don't usually happen one at a time. And so when something comes up for you that you're, you're coming to us for a loan for, we don't want you to be caught unprepared for the next, the next thing that should happen. Um, that's really it. We, you know, we don't charge interest, so we are making lending decisions based on our belief of a person's ability to pay. Again, we look at a credit report. We ask to have a conversation with you, with our loan committee, for you to, to give us the story of what that credit report is telling us. You know, I talked to a woman not too long ago who did file for bankruptcy in the year past, but she had gotten into a loan from the uh, Shyster Bank, and the loan defaulted through no fault of her own. And so she ended up in the situation where then she couldn't get any other loan to, to help with the things that she needed to do, but it wasn't her fault she was in that situation. We try to provide financial opportunities <coughs> for people um, who aren't able to find them in a traditional financial institution. Um, you, one of the greatest barriers to our program, I will say, is the need to have a guarantor. So this is somebody in the community who can you know, be there for you if something should happen to the loan. It doesn't have to be somebody to your ability to pay. It doesn't have to be somebody in any better financial situation as you. It's really a touchstone to a community that we know you have somebody who's there to help you and encourage you along the way. We will have a conversation with you where Part of our values is to lay on the Jewish guilt a little bit, so we want to know that there's somebody in the neighborhood there who we can, who can be our proxy uh, bubby who's going to help you pay that loan, help you make sure that loan gets paid. Um, that's the, the main gist. One of the other things I do want to say about um, what, how, we, how we review our, a loan, we will look at a variety of types of income. We had somebody come in who put down a monthly budget and you know in the in the income section she had just put down what she gets from her you know bank teller job whatever it was and you know but then as we're looking through her bank statements we see all of these Zell payments and 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 all of that uh, and we asked her about it it's like well it, it seems like you have a lot of this other money coming in what is this she says oh i give music lessons on the side but i didn't think that was actually that's income if you can estimate that for us 
we can incorporate that into your monthly income and that goes into your to our assessment of your ability to pay. Uh, so, you know, again, this is, it's not like a traditional financial institution where that's not going to work. The other thing I will say too, thinking about it in the long game, we report credit. So we pull a credit report and we report credit. If you can show on-time payments, that improves your credit exponentially. Our goal is to make sure that the people who are participating in, a lo in our loan program are better off in a, in a better financial position when they are done with their loan. And so that means being more likely to be bankable in a traditional sense from a traditional financial institution. So we will work with the individual throughout the life of the loan though. If you get a $10,000 loan from us, pay back over 60 months, and you know, two years in, you, you know, lose a job, or you have a contract that falls through or something, as long as you maintain contact with us, we can help re you know, reconfigure the terms of that loan for a period of time to help you get through that time when you have less income. So if you're making a $200 monthly payment, and your income's down, we'll talk to you about what does the $20 monthly payment look like for six months? What's the time frame that you need? We have people who take 10 years to pay back a loan. We have people who pay back their loan early and we don't penalize them for that because, yay. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, I, we really want to work with people. I, we're, I was talking uh, before the program, we're not a CDFI, we're not a bank. We can be, we are working um, currently to find new ways to be creative in how we do our lending because we want to make it easier. Like, what's a CDFI for anyone? I'm sorry, a Community Development Financial Institution. So um, ECDI, if you're familiar with them, they are a CDFI, or they're like a CDFI. Um, That's an economic. Economic and Community Development Institute, something like that. Think, something? Um, but that, and that's another institution that you know may be an option for people. Um, you know, the other thing I will say: how many people, as entrepreneurs, how many people have a business account that's separate from your personal account? Not as many people as raise their hand when I ask how many were filed with the state. So you know, you're entrepreneurs. That's the way it works. That. People who look like me, who come from, from my family, have money to support me and my endeavors. That doesn't happen for everybody. You gotta put in your own skin. You gotta put your own skin in the game oftentimes. Oftentimes, banks will say to you, put your own skin in the game, but then penalize you when you have too much of your own personal money going into your business to break. We can get into that. That's a separate session. <laughs> but, but I, we can work with that. We'll, we'll have that conversation. If it doesn't exist currently, and you can talk to us about what your plan is for how this loan is going to help you get to that place, help you get to the next level of, of entrepreneurship, where you're putting those systems in place, we, we want to help you get to that. So, are there, can we ask questions now? Or do you yeah, I just wanted to say hi, I'm Patty, I work at Jumpstart. Um, so for any of you here who want to be more of an entrepreneur in your entrepreneurial journey, at Jumpstart we do provide resources to entrepreneurs wanting to you know, learn and grow and we work with HFLA and all of the other organizations and all of our services are free of charge as well. So I know we have some of our clients here in the room already, so don't, don't be shy, I know it's really hard as an artist to talk about money, to talk about your business, but we don't bite. We can have a conversation with us and just see if we are the right resource for you. Uh, but I just wanted to say hi and say that there's other resources. Yeah. Thank you so much uh, for introducing yourself. I speak pretty loud. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Do you guys provide any types of lines of credit in advance of a true need? If so, there's somebody who's out there who's not going to be able to accept a job because a dollar more increase in their salary is going to cost them 22% more in childcare every month, you know, how do we help somebody get through that place? We don't have that currently. That being said, one of the notes that I did write down too is that, you know, particularly at early stages and in, in entrepreneurship, and things, it's all one pie, right? Like your finances are all one pie. 
And so one of the things that we can do is work with you to figure out where maybe maybe it's rearranging where the loan is going to and some and you know how what it's being used for that maybe it, it is beneficial. So that, that's not a great answer to your, your question, but we don't currently have that. Thank you so much, Carrie. Um, I wanted us to, to transition a little bit to a program that Assembly for the Arts has that um, a lot of you may not be familiar with. Uh, sometimes you want to do a for-profit model. Uh, sometimes you want to do a non-profit model, business model. Sometimes you want to do a social enterprise. Sometimes you want to avoid nonprofits because you don't want to have to deal with having a board of directors and some of the administrative things that go along with starting a nonprofit. So to talk a little bit about that, uh, uh, we have uh, Valerie Schumacher, our director of uh, strategic initiatives at Assembly for the Arts, who oversees. So Valerie's going to tell us a little bit about what fiscal sponsorship is and how it could benefit you as an artist. Thank you. Thank you. That was a lovely introduction. There's some, a couple things I may not get to. Um, before I jump into fiscal sponsorship, and I've been listening, um, I love these conversations. One of my observations is coming up from more of the traditional business, like when I was in college, is that you hear hustle in these settings. When you're in business school, you hear startup strategy or sweat equity. So language is really interesting. And even when we're thinking about creative income, we say, we're thinking about creative ways to generate income. My sister's an accountant. She said, this would be illegal for me to present. And I said, no, 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 no. We're not talking about creatively you know, accounting. We're talking about creative ways to generate income. So. Just, it's just an observation. There's really, I, I, just, find, I just find it interesting. Um, but yeah, so when you're thinking about different ways to generate income, grants is grant making, grant uh, writing. It's a big topic. As a nonprofit, we are often, you know, under the gun trying to get all these grants out. But we know there is an interesting, um, there, there's a different level of grants directly to artists or to individuals. There are fewer of them. Um, I do want to throw out Candid. If you're looking for artists directly to individuals, they have an entire database of grants for individuals. It's what it's called. Um, you can go look that up. There are other opportunities, though. Oftentimes, it's for project grants. And we work with a number of individuals who are in the for-profit business. Um, and for that, we serve as a fiscal sponsor. Um, we become then the grantee. So we, we work with a foundation who legally cannot give to individuals in most cases. Um, they can only give to nonprofits. But the project is all entirely on that group. So we operate in a re-granting capacity, meaning that we work with artists who have an idea, um, you're looking for a grant, you know what grant you want, the artist is responsible for all of the project. We don't take any intellectual capital, we don't, um, we don't manage um, contracts, we don't manage negotiations, it's entirely on the project and it's essentially, they want a grant, it's aligned with our mission. We apply for that grant and give it to them. So the only piece that we provide is because it's really important that we are very clear that each of those projects that we're doing that for are mission aligned. They are for the greater good. And it is not, it is a pass through, but it's a pass through that is aligned with the mission. So we have a number of steps to work through to make sure that we're on the same page with the artists, that the, the project is aligned. There are two big reasons why, um, why people need to uh, prove that one is for a project, the other is for somebody who's interested in starting up a nonprofit, and you're not eligible to, for some of these grants that require two to three years or so of history. So we help provide you know, a little bit of that time gap so that you can establish that history, get a few grants, get your startup going. Um, and then it just goes from there. I mean, once you once we have that agreement set up, you apply for a grant, 
grant is approved or denied. We can work with individuals or uh, businesses at any level. So if somebody's like, I don't even know how to write a grant. We've worked with people who we essentially work them through a, steps A through Z to get that in, to make sure that all the T's were crossed and I's were dotted and um, and that it was a compelling argument. Now some organizations are really comfortable with grant writing. They don't need that help from us, so we say, you know what, All you know what you need, we're here to support. You take care of it and we're, you know, we've got you. We don't want to get in your way. So it's a pro, it's really just a program. The, the important piece is that it's, it's a doorway to access funds that you otherwise would not have access to. In and of itself, it is not funding, but it is a way to get that funding that's, that may just be out of reach. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Valerie. So, so if any of you are, are working on a project where you think it could benefit from grant funding. Uh, so sometimes, like Valerie said, you're working on projects that are for the greater good, but you're not a nonprofit. Pursuing grants uh, is one way to, to diversify your funding to support a project or initiative that you're doing. And, and by not being a nonprofit, as Valerie mentioned, you can apply through us. We will sponsor you so that you can uh, qualify for a nonprofit uh, uh, foundational funds or, or grants um, and the only uh, requirement associated with that is that you be a, become a member of, of our organization so um, uh, fiscal sponsorship is is a, a program to benefit artists and we just ask that you be uh, a member of Assembly for the Arts uh, in support of, of that program so that we can continue to sustain uh, that initiative so um, please check out our website or talk to Valerie following the program to learn a little bit more about fiscal sponsorship and how you can uh, pursue grant writing and um, pursue grants to fund your work. And, and Susie wants to add something. Hey, I just wanted to add that um, work when I worked with Metro West, which I actually still do a little bit, it's one of my many puzzles, um, but uh, Metro West Community Development Organization, I would also be a fiscal sponsor for like community grants in the neighborhood, and I think a lot of people didn't realize they could do that. So a lot of individual community members would, um, you know, I'd help them apply for the grant, and then we would just take the money, and then I'd cut them a check for the full amount, and we wouldn't take any out of it, um, as long as it was, yeah, I think maybe when we do it for like larger organizations, they take a little bit, but um, yeah. So community development organizations might be another option. Absolutely, thank you, Susie. So yeah, look into those community organizations in your neighborhood who can support you as a fiscal sponsor. Um, and I'm gonna pass it back over to Meg Bam. Thank you so much. Um, yes, and I think this was really helpful clarity too because we get questions about well, what it, you, you hear the word sponsorship and automatically people think, oh, Assembly's giving me money or you know, or a, a community development corporation is going to give me money and that's, it's not exactly that. So this is, I think, super helpful clarification um, and we're, like Deidre said, happy to answer questions about this. I wanted to open it up. We've got just a few minutes left and you know, if folks had like a burning thing that they really wanted to talk about or a question for Perry or a question for Valerie, or just generally, let's just kind of open it up. As far as like, um, you know, one thing I'd say that I'm noticing that some of the best, like some of the people that I'm seeing around town that are really getting a lot of traction is, you know, when we talk about hustling and stuff like that, you know, I kind of, during the pandemic, I kind of backed myself into my, into my work, into my room. You know, I was kind of into, into my cave, you know what I mean? So I'm the only one filming, I'm doing everything. I'm making arrangements, I'm calling the people, and I'm send up a thing, I write interview questions. And what I started learning is there's a lot of things that I don't like to do that are some people's passion areas. You know what I mean? And there's other people that can kind of help you. So I think sometimes speaking up is a good thing. It's that it, it becomes the, 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 the caveat, and all of this is grain of salt. The caveat is, you know, being able to afford those people and do those things as well. But you never know, that might be somebody's real passion area. You're sitting over there dreading it, and somebody else sitting right next to you might be really wanting to help. Um, another thing I say is, you know, like I said, I've been doing this for 15 years, and the last couple of years I've met a lot of new photographers, a lot of new videographers, and I don't necessarily, filmmakers, and I don't necessarily feel a com competition with nobody. 
Like, you give this person a camera, they're gonna produce something very different than what I produce. And I can't be everywhere all the time doing everything. So I think that it's really like, for example, you know, I don't do a lot of music videos, I do them, but I don't do them a lot. So I know other filmmakers that do music videos. So if I wanna pass that off to somebody else, it's good to do that. I don't do a lot of weddings anymore, you know what I mean? But there are a lot of people that do that. So sometimes like harboring those resources and stuff like that, if you have time and you know, it's not, you can't, I'm not perfect and I'm working on it, but that's kind of where my personal kind of intention is right now to really try to, you know, if I can't fulfill a job or I don't have time to do it and or I don't really want to, or I don't think it's gonna be a good fit for me, it's really important to like, you know, just kind of spread that community so this Cleveland can be a city that, you know, is a community focused city and not just, I'm, I'm a wolf in this, in the garage. And then kind of sitting in, you know, on your own morals. So. But um, I got an event coming up, you know, August 5th, Inspire City Block Party. And what it does is uh, we bridge the gap between young and old people. And it's really based around like miracle and street art, but we do encourage other artists to come through. Also, my shop is dubbed as an art gallery. You know, we have done art shows for the past like five years now. So um, I would like to speak to you about 40th and St. Clair, 43rd and St. Clair. It's literally right there. It's called uh, Red Lion Tattoo. So I'm a little nervous on the mic. I'm not used to talking in large groups. But, you know, I like to see that there's a lot of artists here. And what we're trying to do over here, I definitely want to let you know that my shop and my team is definitely supportive to every artist that's in here who want to come deal with us. Thank you. Inspire Your City Block Party. All right, if you want to learn more, see Day's Day 1 afterwards, Block Party. Inspire Your City. All right, you have to come over there. Hi, um, can you hear me? Hi. I'm Shannon Morris. I run Artful Ohio on the east side. We have 30 art studios. So we have a lot of artists that need this response with us, so I'm asking a follow-up question for them. Um, do you help them find grants? Good question. We do have a list of foundations that we know accept fiscal sponsorship. We don't do active grants searches for artists. We could help and support and provide the resources because Candid is really there for that to help people. And even I think a number of the local libraries have access to those same databases and librarians can support with that. So there's a ways we get to it, but we don't. In we don't necessarily do sort of the grant search for you on behalf of Welcome to the Brown Place. Uh, we closed on this building uh, first week or so of March. We wanted to be home to an intentional, inclusive, interdisciplinary, creative community. So I hope you will all come back and join us. Uh, we offer different levels of membership. We have office space for lease. Uh, we have fabulous uh, spaces within the building to share, like this ballroom. Um, and I would love to show you the rest of the